Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in May. I do have a cold at the moment, I don't know, it's just taking over my life. It's another bank holiday where I'm ill and it's very annoying. But during the month of May, I read eight books in total, four graphic novels, two audiobooks and two physical books. So I'll start with the graphic novels to get those out of the way. So I actually read these graphic novels for work. I think I've said that in another reading vlog before, but at the time I only read one of them. Um, maybe it was my what I read on holiday. But I have read Forgiveness is Really Strange. I've read Anxiety is Really Strange touch is really strange and then trauma is really strange there's one more that i need to read which is pain is really strange and really i read these for work um just to look at doing a marketing campaign for them so i felt like i just needed to know the contents of the book this one isn't actually part of it but i wanted to see um the just the continuation of it as well i just closed the window i don't know if that made a huge difference to this difference to the sound but trauma is really strange i definitely spoke about it in that what I read on holiday rather what I didn't read on holiday and I really enjoyed this one it was a really nice explanation of trauma what trauma does to the body what trauma does to the mind and how you can forget certain things and what and how certain things can trigger you for all of these books I've obviously marked them on my goodreads but I've not rated them I just feel like I probably shouldn't um so that's that one touch is really strange again this focuses on touch so a lot of these books are actually aimed at body workers but also for the general reader so this one was quite nice because it focuses on obviously the sensation of touch but what that means to people and how things like the covid19 pandemic affected how people touch each other obviously because for ages we weren't even allowed to like hug people or shake hands and things like that but it also focuses on simple things like i say simple things but it also focuses on things like you know when touch can be bad so in the sense of abuse and sexual abuse and so i feel like it covers a whole range and at the end this one actually has some like exercises that you can do for touch so like in terms of like just yourself like feeling like different parts of your body but then also there is one that you can do with a partner and this one is anxiety is really strange and a lot of this focuses on like fight and flight um nature versus nurture and why your body is reacting to things in certain ways i feel like this book is a lot lighter than the rest of them but yeah this book also has some exercises at the end of how you can try and sort of halt anxiety i think halt also actually does definitely stand for something in here because it's about breaking that cycle of when you're in that moment of panic so yeah Holt stands for hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And it says here, do not make decisions if you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Um, so yeah, I think out of the three that I've read, Trauma is Really Strange is the best one that I liked out of the this sort of series by um, Steve Haynes and Sophie Standing as the illustrator. And this one is also illustrated by um, Sophie Standing, and this is Forgiveness is Really Strange. And I believe this is born out of the Forgiveness Project, which I feel like these two authors run. This one was a really interesting one because it's talking about forgiving people, not just, you know, like when people, someone cuts you off on the, when you're driving or something like that, like huge instances, like if, you know, the suicide bomber that was, not the suicide bomber because that person would be dead, like the person that was involved in an attack that like harmed your loved one, like killed your loved one. It's about those huge moments of forgiveness and these people who have forgiven so many people for these huge horrific acts. Um, and it was just very interesting, interesting to see because it's the act of forgiveness allowing them to move on with their lives. It's not that acknowledgement that what you did was right, but it's more perhaps I can see sort of see what you did, but also I forgive you so that I can move on. Um, so this was quite nice. It was actually a nice collection of like other people's stories of forgiveness um, and yeah what what forgiveness or what anger can spiral into um when you're angry at the person who has wronged you and how perhaps that isn't really good for you that's a really rubbish explanation of this book but it's really lovely i really enjoyed this one so a book i read that i have already spoken about in a reading book which has just gone up is test signal um this is a northern anthology of writing edited by nathan Connolly. so i won't talk about this here but i did end up giving this three stars it was a really wonderful anthology that made me get out of a reading slump and for that i am ever so grateful but yeah i definitely encourage you to watch that video but also to pick this book up because it was a really really great collection so let's talk about two, the two audiobooks that i read because they were both agatha christie's and the first one is the 450 from paddington by agatha christie this is a miss marple i gave this one star i just got onto this point with the miss marple novels where i was just like i feel like these are just mystery novels and miss marple is being shoehorned in here at times 
and this is what this book very much felt like. So the 415 from Paddington. So I actually knew majority of this plot because I listened to a podcast where they discussed this book but I'd honestly forgotten like who the murderer was so when it came to the end I was just like oh I, I did not see that coming. Um, the 415 from Paddington is also called what Mrs McKillicuddy saw um, in America because it starts off in the train with this woman named Mrs McKillicuddy. She is on the train and as another train passes by her, she sees a woman being strangled and she sees the back of the man's head and she sees like the woman's, obviously she sees the woman's face and everything like that. And she tells the inspector on the train, but she also ends up telling Jay Markle because obviously her friend is Miss Markle. Like, why wouldn't she be? The story then moves on to a character named Lucy Isles Barrow, and it basically follows on from that. I don't want to go into this a bit too much because I have already spoken about this book and done sort of a, essentially a wrap up of it in my what I read when I was on holiday because that's when I finished it at the beginning of May. But it essentially goes on to be sort of like Lucy is she's domestic help she's a domestic amazing domestic help and she goes into the house that miss marple suspects the body must be in just based on where the curve in the train in the, on its track and where would be a logical place for a body to be sort of um, thrown off the train because the body was never discovered off the train so she sends lucy in there to the house and Lucy investigates and it involves all the different characters in the house. There is a woman in the house, I really can't remember her name, but then she has three brothers who are not living in the house, but who all come back to the house when the murder of this woman is discovered. Because Spoiler alert, which it isn't spoiler, the body is in their house. And then there's also this grumpy old dad. And there's obviously a lot to do with money and who inherits money. But the main um, pressing issue throughout all of this novel is who is this woman? Like. Her face has been so disfigured and she's been there for such a long time that no one can tell who she actually is and the person that they think it is they're just like is it really her and they're going down many different avenues to find out who it is it's very long-winded story it's super super long-winded and miss marple is like shoehorned in and this really random angle and it isn't really present throughout the book so it's just very much a mystery that's about like lucy and all these brothers that admire her and then the mystery of someone who is kind of in the story but also like never really in the story lurking in the background but then is the murderer so yeah i end up giving this one star because i was like i am fed up <laughs> absolutely fed up with the miss marvel series so what i decided to do was go back and listen to a poirot novel that i really liked because i think i started listening to the poirot stuff in 2019 so it's been a while since i've listened to some of the earlier stuff and the way i listened to it was in publication order so i went back and listened to the murder of roger Ackroyd, which is a really sort of popular one and i think it's one that you know you either love it or you hate it kind of one but i really enjoyed it like i enjoyed it the first time around and i enjoyed it the second time around um and yeah i still gave it the same amount of stars and obviously upon a reread it's not obvious but a lot of the hints are there of who is the murderer and I, because it's a wrap-up not review i'm not going to spoil it but the plot device used in this is like really good because you're reading the story and focusing on so many different characters that actually you forget to focus on one other character um, and that's kind of where like you as a reader you see your downfall because you never consider who it, who else it could be um, but it was really nice to see Poirot in this novel I don't think Poirot was as arrogant or stuck up in this novel as he was in others so the murder of Roger Ackroyd is about the murder of Roger Ackroyd he is found dead in his study um his doctor he's speaking with his doctor about the blackmail of a woman he was about to marry and she has been found dead i think she killed herself um and he receives a letter and he's speaking to his friend and he says actually i want to read the rest of this letter by myself his friend goes home later his friend receives a phone call saying that this his friend is like the roger ackroyd is dead um can he come to the house so he rushes there and um, gets there the door is locked the servant there is like i never rang you like i don't know what's going on and so begins the murder inquiry. Um, Poirot has just moved into this neighbourhood, people don't know who he is, no one knows that he's a private detective, and um, they're just like, oh, this strange little foreign man. Eventually he is brought in on the case by one of the people, one of the family members who is a, a family member of Roger Ackroyd because she wants him to solve the case because it looks very black against a man that she's about to marry. So that's why he is brought in and he is investigating along with his 
sidekick I would say the person that is like replacing Hastings temporarily for this book and finding out what is happening and I think this one is a really nice Christie because it's one of the ones where there's loads of different little side plots which to me make a lot of sense sometimes in the Christie novels there's these little side plots which don't really make sense and particularly in this book everyone had something to hide but it wasn't like a lot of the things they had to hide wasn't to do with the murder um, it was just more it just so happened that perhaps they were doing something on that night they shouldn't have been doing and therefore it makes them look very suspicious so you're always kind of throwing these red herrings but they're not so like oh this is not really part of the story and essentially yeah that's what Cara Darcy investigates this story there's an issue with timing where people can't really nail down certain things there's an issue with who called the doctor to get him there if the servant says it's not him is the servant who he says he is you know like who and then there's a case of like there was a man seen coming to the house and asking for directions to the house um but where did this man end up going and it's just all these little clues that are not completely adding up and Poirot is a bit like baffled by them but it's a very clever mystery novel with a lot of intrigue I definitely don't think it's one that gets boring because Poirot is always asking these random questions or sending off these little bits of information that you're a bit like why is he asking that? And one of the things he does is he gets the doctor's sister involved, who is a bit of a busybody in the area, and that's sort of to keep her busy, but also to like actually get help from her. But for example, she asks him to find out about the shoes one of the suspected guys was wearing on the day. And again, it baffles people because they're like, what was this guy doing? Like, why is he asking me about these shoes and these boots and things like that? So it involves a lot of Poirot's little quirks, but also they all mean something. So I think it's a really nice novel that really showcases Poirot and his little, yeah, his little quirks, but also has a good sense of mystery and the reveal is very nice. Like, I thought it was very cleverly done. Again, Poirot's sense of, you know, justice sometimes I find a bit like, why are you doing this but you know he sold the crime so i suppose he thinks like that's his bit done but sometimes his case of his choice of justice i'm just like nah like call the police so the final book i read was the maidens by alex mcdades he's the author of the silent patient and i spoke about this in my main reading book but i just wanted to read it just to see what sort of crazy plot twist he was going to pull out and yes he pulled it out i don't for me it's not so much the plot twist it kind of made sense because halfway through the book i was like it seems very obvious of who it could be because <laughs> it's clearly not the person we're supposed to believe it is which is the professor and it says here like you know the maidens are at cambridge university the maidens are cambridge university's most exclusive society whose members are selected by the charismatic professor of greek tragedy edward foskett and all throughout the book you're supposed to think it's him it's so clear that it's not him so I gave this book one star because three quarters of the book is essentially made up of a very weird, not believable investigation and then these small pages are like where all the action happens and I know thrillers, no sorry because thrillers are very much fast paced so I feel like they take you through everything really fast and everything. I feel like this just took me on a tour of Cambridge, <laughs> it just took me through a tour of Cambridge and Cambridge's traditions and I was just like, um, so this is about Mariana who is a group therapist I think she's a psychologist um but anyway she specializes in doing group therapy and straight off the bat you're in one of her sessions and it's just like bloody creepy and one of the guys is bloody creepy and she's not reporting it and you're just like what is wrong with this woman like you're in a position where like this guy is behaving really weirdly like you 100% need to report him for your safety for the safety of others and also the safety of him but anyway she doesn't do that um so she gets a call from her niece Zoe saying that her best friend Tara has been killed um can she come to Cambridge and there's this whole backstory of Mariana and how she met her husband Sebastian which was at Cambridge Uni. Mariana is from Greece her dad was very cold growing up they were very rich but he was very cold growing up because her mum died giving birth to her um and therefore I think that broke him and he was just really mean okay so she meets her husband in Cambridge they she's 36 I think he died like about a year ago and she's you know dealing with that grief and um, so she goes back to Cambridge to see her niece and like that obviously brings back a ton of memories and then all of a sudden she decides she's going to investigate this murder her niece asks her to stay like loads of people are like you can't just leave her because her best friend has died and stuff like that so she decides to say and she becomes very fixated on the fact that it's this one character and it's like obviously not like he has alibis not to say that alibis can't be faked but it's just so obvious throughout the story that it's not him so she essentially is you know an amateur sleuth and yeah the way the police speaks to her i'm just like 
when was this book written? <laughs> like, are we back 40 years ago when we think this is how police people speak? I'm sure they still speak like that now, but it just felt very comical to me in some parts. And um, but yeah, she conducts her own investigation. There is another professor in there that used to be there during Mariana's time. This professor knows everything about Greek mythology, every single Greek play, and there's a lot of Greek that comes up in this, like when the maidens are being killed, there's a lot of postcards being like on their notice boards where it's in full Greek and this woman is just translating it randomly like a bloody dictionary. Like it's so strange. Well, not like a dictionary, like a translator. And it just feels, it feels really weird because that's her like her only purpose is to serve full translation. And like, I'm sure she could have just read a book and translated it. Um, so yeah, we're investigating that murder and also the, we're supposed to be, I guess, curious about the maidens. Now, what doesn't happen in this book is I feel like we could have just gotten some insights from the girls that were part of this society called the maidens. We're given the maidens as this sort of intrigue. They're these girls that come into the funeral of Tara in white um, and, you know, we're told that they're we're told that they're this exclusive elite group um, and that's it. <laughs> Mariana hosts like a group session with them once, like a therapy session with them once and nothing really ever comes from that and I just feel like to really build that intrigue and to serve as you know some sort of suspense for us the reader is what this group was about. It would have been good to have some chapters from the people in that group so we knew what they were doing because to me it just seemed like well was probably shagging all of them that's why they're just forming this group it never felt like to me that there was anything sinister about the group that they were out there on a murder hunt it just never felt like that the other thing is obviously mariana and her sleuthing it just seemed really silly she didn't have the resources to do that and then it's just a lot of time spent meandering around cambridge when she's on the train to cambridge she meets this guy and then she's always meeting him in cambridge because like i don't know if he wants to help with the investigation i suppose and he's like just taking an interest to her um so we're just given loads of background and information about like the streets in cambridge the shops in cambridge the traditions in cambridge when they're eating in cambridge and it was just like is, is this just the love of cambridge i don't mind you do you but it's taking up a huge portion of the book so when the murder is revealed it's just like so obvious like as it comes towards the end and like i said it's like a small portion of the book and i just thought that was really badly paced like, i just felt like this book was so badly paced it's so clear that mariana has a lot of blind spots like as someone who is obviously a trained psychologist like psychotherapist there is clearly so much that she's dealing with that she's not able to see this case properly and that's fine there's nothing wrong with the flawed narrator but it's just like <laughs> when we're reading the book it's just like these little things get revealed at the end and you're just like whoa this story is crazy like how did marianne miss this like how and also well okay she could have missed it but then it's like other things that other people knew and i'm just like how did they never say anything but okay that's also explained the only intriguing thing about the ending is how he's managed to pull it together so there's a connection with the silent patient and i thought oh that's interesting i'm really intrigued to see what he does with that as a connection um but other than that yeah it came to the reveal in the end and i just thought i've read all of this and it wasn't even like it was well written it was just a, just standard writing for a thriller right um so I just read all of that when nothing ha really happens for the first three quarters of the book and everything happens at the end. The reveal was kind of shit, I'm not going to lie. Like, I just thought, okay, whatever, this is a bit sick, but cool. Um, and then, yeah, it was just, it was it was disappointing, if I'm honest. Like, it just wasn't for me personally. Um, I just felt it could have been balanced out a lot more. What I would have liked to see is actually dealing with the aftermath of this a little bit more. And I think that would have balanced the book out a bit more. It just felt a bit more like really boring going through the investigation everything happens at the end and it was a bit like oh okay and then there's nothing after and you're just like cool well we'll wait for the next installment in like five years again i suppose i don't know how long it took between this and the silent patient so that's my little review on the maidens it wasn't a fave um but like i said i'm now intrigued to see how this all wraps up and connects perhaps with other novels that he's going to write in the future but not a fave. So those are the books that I read during May. Let me know if you have read any of these books and have any thoughts similar to mine. What was the best book that you read in May? Let me know in the comments down below and I'll see you in another video. Bye.